All right, guys, welcome. This video series is going to get you ready for the AP exam. Everything you need to know about AP Gov to get a five on an exam. Let's start with our unit one review. Let's get to it. All right, so let's start at the beginning with some basic principles of US government. All right, so you have this list of seven terms here. Things like limited government, that's the idea that the government is limited in nature. I know that's exactly what it sounds like, but it means that the government can only do what the Constitution allows it to do. It can't go beyond that. It's based on the idea here of these three terms, natural rights, popular sovereignty, and social contract, which mean that we have rights that don't come from any government, but rather they come from something greater than that. We have these naturally. We were born with these rights. People are the source of all governmental power. That's what popular sovereignty is. People are the source of power. And the social contract tells us that the government, their duty is to protect the rights of the people. Because they get their power from the people, their job is to protect individual rights. Republicanism refers to the fact that we have a representative form of government. Nobody is above the law. And while we want the majority to be able to make policies, we need to at the same time ensure that we protect minority rights. So these are your basic principles of American government. All right, so along with that, again, we have a republic, not a democracy. We have a representative form of government. So we choose representatives. We do not directly vote on policies and issues. That's direct democracy. Even though that doesn't occur at the federal level, there are some states that do have some direct democracy at state and local levels. Things like initiatives and referendums. Initiative is where a citizen actually can write a bill, and if he gets enough ballot uh, signatures, it can be voted on by the general public in that state or local government. Same thing with the referendum. This time somebody in government writes that bill, but then it's put to the people for a vote. So we do have some examples of direct democracy, but again, only at state and local levels. At the federal level, it's all representative. It's a republic. All right, so which type of democracy is best? We have three models here, participatory, pluralist, and elite. Those who favor participatory democracy favor broad participation in politics by the general public. So they want people out there marching in the streets being active, taking part in what's going on. Pluralist democracy emphasizes groups of people coming together, so forming interest groups, forming political parties. This is what James Madison talked about when he talked about in Federalist Number 10 uh, about controlling factions because we have so many different groups competing with each other. That's this idea of pluralism. Elite democracy, the Constitution is embodied in that where it emphasizes a limited role for the public. So the people could vote for their representative, but we're gonna go ahead and let the state government officials choose senators. And we're gonna let the electoral college choose the president instead of the, the public. So we have these three things all kind of competing within our American system. All right, so central to the Constitutional Convention is compromise. We don't think about that. Sometimes we assume the Constitution just came down the way that it is, but it really didn't. You had small states that wanted representation done equally in Congress, whereas large states want it done based on population. We come together, we have the Grand Committee that forms this great compromise and creates the bicameral legislature, which gives the House to benefit the large states, the Senate, which benefits the small states. With the Electoral College, some wanted the people to directly choose the president, while others wanted Congress to do it. So again, we have the Electoral College, which they choose the president, but people get to choose the members of the Electoral College. The three-fifths compromise, this is where we get to the issue of slavery and southern states all of a sudden wanted slaves to count as people because that would have gotten them more representation in Congress. Um, the compromise is that they would count as three fifths of a person. So this causes the South to be overrepresented in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College. And they agreed to kind of push off the matter of the slave trade for 20 years. We'll come back to it then. So again, you have these compromises that made it possible to get the Constitution ratified. So when we talk about the main features of the U.S. Constitution, separation of powers, Congress, their job is to make laws. The president and the executive branch's job is to enforce laws. The judicial branch's job is to interpret those laws. So they each have their own job. That's separation of powers. Checks and balances now, we allow those three branches to interact with each other, to check and limit one another's influence. So things like a president being able to veto a bill from Congress, um, Congress being able to confirm the president's appointment to the Supreme Court. So we have that interaction taking place with checks and balances. 
Federalism is this division of power between national, state, and local governments. So again, we have separation of powers at the federal level. Then we have federalism, which is where we have both state and national governments, sometimes overlapping, sometimes not. These other three have been talked about previously. Again, a government that can only do what the Constitution lets it. Representative form of government from which people are the source of power. The Federalists, they wanted the new Constitution. They wanted a stronger central government. Something like Shays' Rebellion proved to them the need for that. Whereas Anti-Federalists, they strongly favored states' rights. They were very skeptical, suspicious of a national government. They felt like it would trample the states and destroy individual liberty. All right, so we end up with federalism and it has some good and some bad things. Advantages, we have a lot of different ways we can influence government, multiple access points. States are able to make policies specific to their needs. So things like in Florida, um, we have hurricanes. So states can make policies that are specific to that need that we have hurricanes from time to time. States can be laboratories of democracy, so they can test out and try a policy while the other states get to observe and see whether that policy is successful or not and whether that's something that they would like to do themselves. So something like Colorado with marijuana is a great example of laboratories of democracy. On the other hand, when the federal government wants to make uniform policies or unified policies, that can be difficult. And it seems through our history that at times, states' rights claims have been used to perpetuate discrimination by impeding minority rights. All right, so here are a list of powers, and I hate to say this, but this is just vocab that you gotta know. Uh, we have delegated powers. These are ones that are given to the federal government. On the other hand, reserve powers in the 10th Amendment, they are kept or held by the states. Concurrent powers, things like taxing and borrowing money, those are things that both governments, state and federal, can do. So delegated federal, reserve states, concurrent, both. Express powers are directly stated in the Constitution, so they're not really debatable. On the other hand, implied powers and inherent powers, neither of them are stated. Congress claims to have implied powers, and presidents claim to have inherent powers. The basis for implied powers for Congress is Article 1, Section 8, the Necessary and Proper Clause. All right, so with federalism, we have both dual and cooperative. So in dual federalism, the states and the federal government, they each mind their own business. They have their own jobs, they handle those jobs, and they don't overlap. This is called layer cake federalism. So you have a layer of vanilla, a layer of chocolate, and they don't mix and mingle. So that's like dual federalism. They each stick to their job. We don't have dual federalism anymore. We have cooperative federalism. This is like a marble cake where the responsibilities are blurred. They both share the responsibilities. They share the costs. They both have a role in administering them. This increases federal power because what happens is Congress gives states money for them to uh, engage in policies that technically Congress doesn't have the power to tell them what to do, but Congress can dangle money in front of them and say, hey, if you want this money, we'll give it to you. You just have to make education policy the way we want you to. And so we have seen the rise of co cooperative federalism, especially since the New Deal. Along with that is there has been a tremendous increase in grants from the federal government to the states. When you see the word grant, I want you to think of money. Categorical grants, that's money from the federal government that they give states with a specific purpose. And sometimes that money comes with a condition of aid. For example, in the 1980s, the Reagan administration, they told states, hey, if you want to keep getting money for transportation, guess what? You need to raise your drinking age so you keep getting these grants for transportation. Block grants, federal money that states prefer because they have a more broad purpose. So states have more freedom of what they can use that money for with a block grant. There are also things known as funded and unfunded mandates. This is just a rule from the federal government that states must comply with whether or not it comes with any money. So states really tend to get upset about unfunded mandates. All right, three of the biggest constitutional clauses that you must know for this AP Gov exam are here on this slide. The Necessary and Proper Clause allows Congress to make laws that are necessary to carry out their expressed powers. So this strengthens Congress. They can make laws about things that aren't directly expressed. This gives them implied powers but note, there is a limit because these laws do have to be related to their expressed powers. So it can't be on just anything. 
The Supremacy Clause is in Article 4 of the Constitution, and it states that when federal and state laws come into conflict, the federal law is superior. And the Commerce Clause, which has been used to greatly expand congressional power, it says that Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce, so trade between states. Over time, though, our interpretation of this has been expanded. It became in Gibbons versus Ogden where only Congress could regulate interstate commerce, so now states can't do it either. And then in Wickard versus Filburn, it became that anything affecting interstate commerce can also be regulated by Congress. So it doesn't even actually have to be interstate commerce anymore. It just has to affect it. So for example, a person who has a restaurant that they own in a single state, they might believe that they are engaging in intrastate commerce because they're within a single state, but you going to that restaurant, that affects interstate commerce because, well, you're not going to a restaurant that has a chain in multiple states. So even though you didn't engage in interstate commerce directly, your behavior is affecting it, which means Congress can make laws about it. So this Commerce Clause has been used to significantly increase federal power. So after 200 years of the federal government totally winning this battle and gaining more and more power through cases like McCulloch versus Maryland and those clauses we talked about on the previous slide, we have seen a trend in recent years towards states' rights again. So the 10th Amendment has once again become important. This amendment says that all powers not delegated to the federal or denied to the states are reserved for the states and to the people. So this has breathed new life into states' rights. Along with this is the idea of devolution. So this is a movement that would return power that the national government has taken and give it back to the state level. And one of your acquired cases, U.S. versus Lopez, 1995, it actually limited Congress's use of the Commerce Clause for the first time in nearly 60 years, where they ruled against Congress and said, no, that's going too far. For the details on that, check out the video of U.S. versus Lopez or the required Supreme Court case video. All right, so thank you so much for watching. I hope this video helped. There's a whole series here to help you get ready for this AP exam. If this video helped you, please hit that like button, help spread this to other people that they can benefit as well. Subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, this has been a La Money production.